It's been two weeks since season 11 came out and we have official win rates from the game director himself for a few heroes, along with a slight shift in power to some previous problematic heroes. So here's my take on this season's tier list on this first patch. Diva is back to B tier with her recent season 11 buffs to her weapon spread and booster damage to help with her burst. Aaron Keller also said Diva's win rate is up since the patch, hovering around 50 to 55%. Doomfist is okay-ish, but honestly struggling a bit and has taken a big L this patch thanks to the meta development. It obviously depends on what the enemy team is playing, but Cassidy's Hindernade is still a threat. It's hard to deal with the rise of the Flyers with Echo and Farah, which you can't really do much about. And I'd probably place him in the C tier in niche right here, and it just kind of depends on the hero choices. For Junker Queen, I think the buffs to Queen for Season 11 seem to have given her some life, right? The knife pulls are better against the knockback resistance for tanks, the wind-up time for Rampage is seriously so nice, and it's much harder for it to randomly get interrupted now. Cassidy's Hindernade is easier to play around since he can't just lob it and accidentally stop you, and Roadhog has played a lot less since the nerfs, and overall, I'd place her now as a fine choice in the B tier. Mauga, Mauga, Mauga. Mauga wasn't touched and is an easy fallback choice for players to just pick and get instant value on many, many tank matchups. And you couple that with some fantastic synergy with you know both Farah and Venture, which we saw back in the OWCS patch last month, and you've got yourself a solid a tier hero right now. Orisa's ability cycling was nerfed a lot in season 10, and I put her in D tier back then. And in Season 11, she got one more second back on the Javelin spin, but compared to when she was A tier, she's still at a net loss of two seconds of not having a defensive ability, which is a giant vulnerable window for a tank of her size and caliber of hitbox. That means Arissa has to like chill and take cover a lot more, and then that makes her lose a bit of space, and she's like squishy for those two seconds every 15 seconds or so as she's cycling all the abilities. So to me, she still feels like the toughest tank to play right now and is indeed here. Additionally, one of her best matchups was Roadhog and Roadhog was nerfed. So like, I don't see too many spots where you'd need to swap to her right now. I think Ramantra in ranked is fine in B tier. He's sturdy, he's reliable, he can buy a lot of time for his team thanks to his block and higher level players can take advantage of this in most cases. However, his solo carry kill potential went down a lot since Season 9, with most heroes being above 250 HP, which means you need 4 punches plus a melee instead of 3 punches. Additionally, Mauga is just a better brawl option and is a lot easier to play, and it kind of makes Ramatra incredibly unpopular among players at this time. Ryan has gotten buff after buff after buff, and you know, in a vacuum, he's objectively a pretty good strong hero. He absolutely mauls players in the metal ranks and is serviceable even in the high ranks. The only issue with him is despite his big strengths, there will be times where he just runs into the hold shield and do nothing play style if the map where the comp he's being played into is just kind of unplayable. Like a Fara Mercy or like a Tracer Ball zipping around or a Malka constantly pounding your shield and you have to put it up to stop him from healing. Like he's a little better now in the Kiriko matchup since it no longer wakes people up from Earth Shatter. So at least that's more reliable now. Hey, that's pretty good. All in all, I think Ryan is kind of similar to Ramatra in Brawl power level at this moment. And it's kind of just dependent on the skill and comfort. So yeah, about B tier. Roadhog was a bit problematic back then in ranked due to his ridiculous survivability thanks to that headshot damage reduction for tanks and the 50% damage reduction on Take a Breather, but the Season 11 patch did nerf him 50 HP and cut the damage reduction from 50 to 40%, which is meaningful, and to me knocks him down from the previous A tier to a respectable B tier. He's still serviceable to punish mistakes in ranked and will keep a couple of matchups at bay. Sigma is just a constant staple, patch after patch after patch, and he stays in A tier. He doesn't feel too cheap or annoying to play against, and he has, you know, very good damage, which is technically buffed against armor, and sometimes you'll have matchups where you constantly have to shoot the other armored tank, so that works out in his favor. You mitigate a ton of stuff with both your shield and your, you know, your suck ability, and even if all those abilities go down, you also get that 25% damage reduction to the noggin. Alari's increase in playtime this patch also complements Sigma, as they're both in the poke archetype, and if you wanted another reason to pick him up, there you go. Winton, Winton, I'd say he's A tier. 
just a solid dive tank that pretty much ignored the armor changes in mid-season 10, and the previous tougher matchups like D.Va aren't as bad thanks to that. And then Roadhog isn't being played as much right now, which helps. Ana synergy is always good. Not much to add that wasn't said in the last tier video. Tier list video, excuse me. A tier. Hmm, Wrecking Ball. I think it's kind of hard to gauge Ball accurately because he's really only played effectively by a select number of players. But I mentioned Ball being like a sleeper pick in the last tier list video, and my opinion hasn't really shifted. I'll pretty much just echo what I said last time, which is that Ball's four four mid-season 10 buffs absolutely stacked his kit with the whole grapple retraction as well which saves the cooldown of it and it can give you free pile drives you can also you know keep disengaging to go to health packs to temporarily remove the dps passive you can roll back and give your teammates adaptive shields which was demonstrated to be effective at the highest level at you know dreamhack last month i'd say he's pretty damn good right now in b plus and if you're like a ball connoisseur he's like great or arguably just giga meta for you Okay, Zarya. I think Zarya is dependent on the comp, like by this definition, at least from my experience. What's interesting is that Aaron Keller said that Zarya is actually, you know, above this, you know, pretty good and averaged out across all ranks, of course, in the 50 to 55% win rate, didn't specify. But to me, you know, she's dependent on the map due to her limited range and dependent on whether you're kind of running a specific bubble strategy, like bubbling the Farah Barrage or bubbling the Venture Engagement. You know, Winton is pretty popular again, right? And that's kind of a tough matchup. So if you that's if you really want to lean into the whole counter swapping argument. But other than that, I do find it hard to justify playing Zarya as your brawl option over any of the other brawl options. She's like, you know, high feast or famine kind of hero. If you can get energy and it's like a short range map, like a lot of the flashpoint maps, I'm sure you'll still find a lot of success. Ash is a great hitscan option right now for many reasons. Number one, Sojourn was nerfed, so there's more opportunities to pick Ash. Number two, it's another option to kind of help slow down the Farah and the Echoes. Number three, Dynamite is strong after the armor changes in mid-season 10. It deals the full 145 damage, only minus five from the total versus having it, you know, 30% weaker against armor. Number four, that Dynamite applies a DPS passive for seven seconds. Number five, Bob also applies a DPS passive and is another free player and warm body to cuddle. And number six, she has a mythic skin, so she's A tier. Okay, I think Bastion is still too dependent on the right comp built around him, which is the same story almost every season, so kind of just stays in C tier for me. Cassidy received a bit of tweaks for season 11, right? The flashbang is back. It still hinders, it has limited range, but it is more predictable to play around for both Cassidy and the opponent. A uh, high noon is a little bit deadlier with the increased movement speed at the end of it, at the cost of lower damage reduction. All this to say, he's still S tier, in my opinion. His flashbang keeps certain tanks from dominating, his shots are still lethal at close to mid range with the double headshot damage breakpoint, and I think he's going to continue to be S or A tier unless they potentially nerf maybe his HP by 25. Why does he have 275 HP and not 250? And he's going to stay there because, you know, that's a decent nerf to go for without making his weapon feel like a water gun again. Echo has always been like high tier since like forever, but I'm going to argue that she's actually up to S tier in the meta this time because she actually contests Farah quite well especially if you haven't mastered the new Farah movement reworks instead of mirroring it. You play Echo to kind of mark the Farah because it's a little difficult for the Farah to land back-to-back -back air space body shots versus you as the Echo. And then, you know, as an Echo, you can chip her back down with a higher fire rate on your try shot. But outside of that matchup, you know, you still play high enough in the sky to avoid tracers and a lot of tanks. You're not necessarily reliant on a Mercy, so you can slot in on a lot of different comps. And of course, you still have Duplicate, which is an incredible, incredible DPS ultimate. Genji, not bad. Probably sits in B tier for me. There's not much a Genji can do to mark the enemy DPS if they're playing the Flyers like Farah and Echo or hyper mobile heroes like Tracer. So you're kind of stuck just hunting backlines and poking slowly for Blade. The OWCS did demonstrate how lethal all inning with Mauga Cardiac Arrest can be. And, you know, Genji can be an option in that comp as well. And of course, you have to consider the hero comfort. And like Genji's have been playing the game for years and years, being paired with dive heroes like Winston. So you always have that available. Ana's being played a lot again. So you have Nano Blade to have as your crutch. You know, I think he's fine in the B tier. Hanzo, definitely a little niche right now. Uh, C or D tier. It's kind of tough to play when there's just so many other better options right now. He's okay-ish to completely tank bust with storm arrows. In certain maps, he's 
quite decent if you can control and perch up on some of the strong high ground positioning like King's Row third point on offense. But other than that, it's way too hard to like mark the Farah and Echo, for example. And hit scans like Cass or Ash are just easier to maintain that baseline value with their reliable hit scan shots. Anzo can't one shot a clean 250 HP hero anymore. Thank God. But I do think they need to give him a bit more power elsewhere if we don't want to walk back into the whole like random log one shot era of Hanzo again. Junkrat was a bit better last patch, especially getting his primary fire back to 125 damage. So the back to back shot can kill 250 HP hero. The armor changes definitely benefited him as well. But the rise of the Pharah and Echoes, once again, just kind of indirectly makes the Junkrat pick kind of ass, so he's in C tier. Kind of dependent on whether the enemy DPS are running the flyers or not. Mei is kind of in the middle of the pack at B tier. Her ice skull got buffed in its damage at the expense of its projectile size. Not really as noticeable for high level players who are pretty accurate regardless. So it is kind of just a raw DPS buff to help poke down enemies until she can find that opportunity to wall people off and play make in the brawl comps. Brawl of course is solid with Mauga and some other choices. So yeah, B tier. Probably where she belongs right now. Vara, Vara, Vara. S tier. Meta. It's been what, like four months since the rework? Enough time has passed, so here's the reasons why she's up here. Number one, players have definitely adapted to the playstyle. Number two, players always mimic high level play, and the moment her power got demonstrated last month at the OWCS Dreamhack Finals, her pick rate skyrocketed. Number three, the armor changes benefit of burst damage, so her rockets deal 115 damage instead of 84, and she spams them quite quickly. Number four, that tank headshot damage reduction buff didn't affect Farah. She doesn't headshot. Number five, the stats support the tier grading. As Aaron Keller mentioned, she's sitting at a whopping 58% win rate. Obviously, this is without specific context, so I'll assume it's an average across all ranks and regions, but damn, 58% is nutty. Some nerfs are probably around the corner, so enjoy it while you can if you're a Farah player. Reaper in a vacuum is actually quite decent and is very serviceable in the lower ranks thanks to his you know high hp pool 300 lifesteal free escape tool at the high end though i'd argue he's too niche and needs like a perfect brawl comp to complement him because his like solo flank style is kind of bad when there's so many other heroes that can do it better than him and smarter players can sniff out that cheesy play style from a mile away now they did buff him in season 11, which certainly brings up his power level to offset the armor changes, but I'm pretty sure he stays here in the depends on the comp tier. I might be wrong on this, but I think Sojourn is hot ass since her nerfs, and this may be the hottest take of the video. I think she's C tier this patch, right? No longer is she dominating in the S tier. Now you can look at the season 11 changes for her and misinterpret it because it's like, oh, hey, one nerf, but three buffs, what are you talking about, Karku? But you have to look at how frequent these buffs come into play versus the power of the nerf. Sojourn's railgun shot is just flat out 23% weaker. And the rail burst damage is a big part of her gameplay loop. Like every five, 10 seconds, you should have full charge if you're shooting somebody to, you know, threaten them with the rail. The nerf affects your damage breakpoints, the thresholds, kills that would previously killed, but no longer kill. Like it's a massive nerf. And then you compare that to a slight primary fire rate increase. Okay, sure, you can spam your shots a little quicker on your SMG on some tanks. The rail shot can now pierce, but think critically now, how often are enemies actually lining up for you for this to happen on a frequent basis? Overclock energy charge rate going up. I mean, it was already kind of fast before and you only get a few alts a game. And sometimes you do have to sit at that 100 charge if no one's in line of sight right away. So that charge rate, while it can be nice in some situations, not a big game changing buff there. All in all, I think there's just better DPS options right now. And some data from Aaron Keller kind of leans into my hot take a bit. She's the worst performer in the DPS category at 44% win rate. But I will say Sojourn traditionally never had gr a great average win rate because low ranks kind of pulled it down since they missed their rail a lot. And Sojourn was only kind of problematic on the high end of players. Now Soldier, he kind of does a bit of everything, right? He can hold some good positions with Biotic Field. He can continually pepper and apply DPS passive. He kind of does it all. Nothing spectacular, but also nothing abysmal. So just right down the smackdown middle at B tier for me. I think Sombra is in a spot where she can be extremely oppressive, but also kind of meh at the same time. So I'm going to land in the middle at the B tier. She depends on, you know, the comp pick, especially if you're swapping to her to shut down some tanks that are eating your team up like Ball or Doom. And that's 
where she kind of mostly defaults to in ranked play. But other than that, I feel like her flanky assassin style isn't even as good at the high ranks because I think in that scenario, you just play Tracer instead if you're trying to fill that archetype of trying to control and take opportunistic off angles. What's funny is that in like pro play, she's a lot better, you know, with the three, two, one hacks and all ins with the virus and stuff. But then she kind of like falls down to B tier in like high ranked solo queue play. And then she goes back up in metal ranks because a ton of gold players just get like a hundred to zero spawn camp by somber players because they don't know how to deal with her. But for me, I'll average her out again at B tier. You know, for Symmetra, I have put her in C tier, the niche tier for many, many tier lists. And I can finally say I'm going to bump her up to the B tier. Her buffs this patch don't completely like solve her identity, but it certainly helps lean into one playstyle more than the others, which is, you know, that additional 25 HP, which gives her that durability to lean into the brawl beam style. And then the, you know, the charge up rate of the beam got buffed a lot because it's 25% faster for each level of the beam, which saves a lot of time. And that allows you to be incredibly lethal at close range a lot quicker. If you're not ready for it, you will die very fast. Now, that being said, you do need some resources to enable you. So in a way, it kind of does depend on the team comp uh, that your team is running and what the enemy team is running. Where in a perfect world, you can hopefully charge it off their shield. But yeah, I'll go out on a limb and say she's probably B tier right now. Thorbjorn also sits in B tier this patch. Armor changes in mid-season 10 helped his Cheeto burst. The turret is the seventh player, sixth player, excuse me. And the Molten Core is a great zoning tool, of course. Only issue is, again, the rise of the Flyers, which Torb obviously will struggle with. So yeah, he's fine for the most part, as long as you're hard focusing on pressuring the other enemies. Tracer, honestly, not as dominant as she used to be because A, armor changes hurt her pulse pistols a lot. You obviously don't shoot tanks that often, but you know, Brig exists and enemies running more on a Brig can be very annoying for Tracers. B, of course, the rise of flyers. Tracer can't mark the flyers very well. And C, Cassie is still very good as well, as you can see. And you know, you still have to respect the flashbang. It's kind of like an Overwatch one where it's kind of skill dependent. It can go both ways there. So for those reasons, Tracer is no longer S tier. She's in A tier in my opinion, which is still really good. That's probably because there's no other hero that can do what she does. She has an incredibly high skill ceiling, still very good when in combination with like Winston Dive, for example. And this tier list, again, is just my opinion and my experience in ranked. Tracer still haunts me as a support player. I'm playing a lot of Ana again, and it's do or die with my sleep dart. If she can close distance on me, I'm pretty much cooked, especially if I miss the sleep. Venture is in a spot where they're, when they're good, they're like very good, arguably great. But if everyone kind of just sits there and pokes, it can be tough for Venture. Like an enemy fire can slowly be plucking you guys away. So you have to be really crafty with your burrows and really take an opportunistic approach before going all in, like checking if the Cassidy flashbang is out or the Honest Sleep Dart. Unless you have the full Mauga all in comp, this is the downside of locking Venture every game as a generalist DPS, which they're just simply not. Very high potential though, right? With some very reasonable downsides. I honestly love their design as a hero, love them certainly higher than B tier, so I'll probably play it safe at B plus. Good hero. Widowmaker, middle of the pack at B tier, she's fine. It's ranked, you know, it's player dependent. If you're just ripping heads and feeling good, you can absolutely control the lobbies, but there are maps where she's definitely not that good since it depends on the sight lines. Yeah, B tier. Ana is back in A tier for a few reasons. A lot of reasons, actually. Number one, Kiriko is slightly nerfed now. There's more opportunity for Ana. Number two, Winston being played a bit more. It's a nice synergy you can't go wrong with. Number three, the armor changes in mid season 10 made Ana's shot go from 49 damage back then to 70 damage. That is significant. Yes, her damage over time ignores armor now. Number four, the Flyers do have to slightly respect Ana, right? The grandma has no damage fall off and can absolutely pressure them if they're not careful. Number five, if you have a friendly Farah, nanoing your own daughter is a solid play and you can pocket her from a safe distance. What else? Number six, the traditional bodyguard and pairing of Ana Brig is pretty good again. And armor is of course better against Tracer and for the reasons we mentioned earlier, Tracer has played a bit less, which means less flanky threats to Ana, which allows her to generate more value since she isn't dying as often. I'm speaking from experience, the last week of ranked has not been that bad for me as an Ana player. A lot less tracers, and I would personally rather deal with the Fara than a tracer, but that may be a bit subjective. Anyways, let's move on. Baptiste, I think he's still good at B+. You can still play him in plenty of comps that require a lot of healing resources, and of course, being a hitscan support, 
who can always output a lot of damage pressure, is always welcome to keep the Flyers at bay. He hasn't been nerfed or buffed in a while, and the other heroes haven't indirectly swayed him up or down in any direction, and he's remained in this tier for a while now. Briggs' role is a bit more defined on this patch, especially with a lot more Ana being played. You have a core job and is a solid B tier hero right now. Obviously, Briggs is a little useless against the Flyers and super long range poke, but if you play her in like the Ana Brig Winston dive where your team goes all in and shuts the poke down very quickly, that's pretty serviceable. Ilari is very interesting because she suddenly jumped from like a low tier all the way up to S tier, in my opinion, in rank play due to a number of changes over the past two months. Number one, 25% headshot damage reduction that tanks have does not apply for Ilari. She ignores it since her base headshot multiplier was only ever 1.5 times. And further reducing that would have been kind of bad for her, or maybe it was an oversight by Blizzard. Number two, the season 10 armor changes last month directly benefited Ilari's burst. The default 112.5 headshot damage was only dealing roughly 79 damage a pop against armored targets. And then after that patch, it's been dealing 107.5 damage a pop since. It's only a flat five damage. Reduction. Reason number three, Elari is a hitscan slot in to help pressure the rise of the Pharaohs and the Echoes. Number four, she got slightly buffed this patch as well. The outburst damage increasing is pretty marginal, but the pylon change actually helped solidify her identity. Since it heals Ilari less, you know, the solo off angle Ilari playstyle isn't as ideal. It's still fine, but what I found incredibly lethal and good right now is actually just playing behind your tank. Having your pylon nearby, remember it's pumping out more healing to teammates, and it's a bit more durable at 125 HP, and you're always going to be in range to pocket your tank with your beam, and then you can just constantly pound their tank because of the benefits I listed before with the armor, right? You know, a lot of tanks have armor, which isn't as good against her, and then, you know, the headshot passive. So your tank wins with your assistance, and then you go take, you know, the angles after with the pylon and clean up. So yeah. She's good, and the data backs it up from Aaron Keller himself, Ilari being the clear winner of this patch, which has been an interesting sequence of events, to be honest with you. Kiriko's reign of terror is over, in the S tier at least. She's still a great choice in A tier, despite the very marginal nerf to her swift step. I will say I have been punished by it, where I otherwise wouldn't have pre-season 11. In any case, she still does the, you know, Kiriko things she's always done with a unique, adaptable playstyle at the high level that no other support can really do, right? You can contest high ground, off angle poke, heal bot if needed, save someone with Suzu, headshot burst people, she's got it all, and will still remain a great A tier pick. Lifeweaver, honestly, a solid B tier hero. Now hear me out. The OWCS obviously showed us some very strong Lifeweaver spots you can play him in with the, you know, Farah Malga synergy which are obviously very common right now. And for ranked solo queue purposes, remember how Ilari is S tier, right? And rising in popularity? Well, Ilari kind of covers Lifeweaver's biggest weakness, which is that damage pressure. So yeah, I genuinely think Lifeweaver is in B tier right now. So Lucio is still a great hero, but I'm gonna have to bring him down to B plus on this patch specifically, still very good. But hear me out. It's less of Lucio being weak based on his hero kit because they didn't nerf him or anything, but rather because of the meta and what's strong. Because as a Lucio, you can't contest the DPS flyers at all, and if they're dominating a lobby, you really gotta synchronize with your team and tank to kill everyone else before the Pharaoh ruins your team, or else you're inevitably gonna have to swap to like Elari, Bap, or Ana to help pressure her. Remember, in Overwatch, you ideally wanna make your picks to like synergize with your team first, which is what Lucio does really well, because you can slot in, you know, in all comps, brawl, poke, and dive. And then afterwards, you can start adjusting some picks and swaps since it's obviously not working. And on this patch, Farah is very good. And if no one on your team is swapping or has an answer to it, Lucio can be one of your options to replace for a hitscan support to help. Mercy is C tier niche. Now, you may see a huge surge of Mercies right now, but that's in part thanks to the Pink Mercy BCRF charity campaign. But on the competitive side, she's in this tier for me because number one, you know, the Sojourn Pocket isn't there anymore. You don't have nearly the same lethality with the damage boosted rail shots. And number two, Farah Mercy is actually not nearly the same as it was pre Farah rework because you're not flying in open space all the time. And Farah is just kind of like a jiggle poker with her rockets until she's ready to go all in because she's limited on the fuel, right? Compared to how she used to be where she used to just stay really high in the sky with the Mercy and then you maintain that maximum hit scan fall off range where the Mercy can just out heal the damage for the Farah, right? That being said, Mercy is still acceptable with Farah. 
Pretty solid with Echo, solid with Ash, but I think it's niche, at least in the high ranks, because the other supports that are more lethal, like Ilari and Ana, have more impactful game-changing abilities. Moira is fine in B tier. It's solo queue, Moira is quite durable with the heal orb and fade and has reliable damage on some matchups and is a lot more accessible than, you know, Baptiste for those who don't have refined aim mechanics and can still generate a lot of value in mostly brawl comps. I don't really have much to say except for the love of God, do not throw a damage orb into the sky against the flyers. That's a bad matchup, so what you want to do is just simply heal orb and pocket the people down low getting spammed by the Pharah and then you should build your coalescence pretty fast because you're taking a lot of damage and then use that coalescence as your tempo shift and play make off of that. All right, Zenyatta, last one, hot take. I have him in C tier. He's niche to me because his role has pretty much been replaced by Ilari. A couple of sizable nerfs like the 275 to 250 HP back in early season nine to hot fix him, right? Discord isn't permanent. It's hard to shoot back at these flyers. He's still vulnerable to Tracer, you know, if they recognize you're on Zen and she decides to camp you. Like, I don't know. I used to main Zen, right? And there's too many conditions to work around. And by definition, you can still play him. It just depends on the comp. Like Sigma poke on Circuit Royale, sure, with Bap Zen. But where else right now where, you know, Alari isn't just better to fill that poke support slot? So uh, I think he is like B or like B plus in metal ranks but in high ranks there's just better options on this patch that's all this is of course just my opinion form your own opinions and for those who skipped here from the timestamps just to see this entire list just listen to my justification and explanation before you come at me with pitchforks right go to the timestamp of the hero where, where you disagree with or agree with and maybe it'll make a bit more sense maybe it won't who cares there's a mid-season patch in like five days enjoy your weekend matches with this tier list in mind for like the next five days ciao